saying, I've, uh, from some of the things that you're saying and some of the things that I hear in some of your lives, you still got some misconceptions in your life. Teaching's going to correct all of that. But you've got a foundation for it being corrected now. You've got to come. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. You've got to come in the right frame of mind if you want to really catch what we're saying. It's not so much having to read between the lines, but we have interjected enough hints in certain areas that it's surprising to still see failures in some areas, at least failure to comprehend what we're saying. Our last service to some of Many of the comments that were made there show that what I'm saying is true, but you probably don't know what I'm talking about. So hopefully that, hopefully the teaching is going to correct all this as we stay faithful to the word and you come in the right frame of mind to learn and to listen. Hopefully we are not being too repetitive by saying again that you're going to be astounded maybe in the wrong sense of the word, by some things that we're going to be learning in ethics over the next few years. If you don't take to heart now a lot of the preparation that we're giving you. Amen. You ought to already have suspicions about a lot of things Amen. without us having to say anything about them. Yeah. But you need to do more than have suspicions. You need to practice what you believe. Oh, there's just so much, dear friends. I'm telling you, there's so much. There's so much. We read over in 1 Corinthians 8. Let the one who thinks that he knows anything admit that he doesn't know anything as he should know it. Amen. That's really the key. That's over in 1 Corinthians 8 to learning a lot of these things. There's just more than, see, there's just, there's more than I com can communicate here in, here in an hour's or two hours message this morning. There's just more than I can communicate. But we do our best, and then, of course, we've got next week, hopefully, and the week after that, <clears throat> and so forth, to teach some more, and praise the Lord. Well, I want to come to another system this morning. I mean, just in what we're going to say about another system of ethics this morning, there is a lot. You should really have some deep internal changes <clears throat> taking place because of what you're hearing, because Amen. of what you're learning. Amen. I mean some differences in your whole personality. Amen. We're into idealistic ethics. We looked at ethics of education. We're talking about idealistic speculative ones, those ethics that have to do with human thought and reason, not the so-called alleged animal nature of man, but the intellectual capacities and the intellectual nature of man. So without any more fanfare, <clears throat> ethics of self-realization. Ethics of self-realization, which will be our second system of ethics under idealistic speculative ethics. The first was ethics of education. Don't, don't misinterpret, but then don't fail to interpret at all what we said last week about ethics of education. I've had all types of responses since the teaching last Sunday about ethics of education. And I even said then that we're not through talking about it. We're going to come back to it at least one more time, and from what I can remember, we'll be back to it at least two more times. So don't misinterpret what I said, but then some people in trying to make sure that they don't change anything in their life, and they just fail to interpret at all what was said. It's two extremes. Some people just want to just change every single thing. <laughs> and then some people say, okay, I see the point of what you're saying, so really nothing needs to be done as long as I understand in my heart. Well, that's not exactly right. It's <laughs> in so between those two things. Well, you listen to what we're saying here. Amen. Amen. I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. Okay, ethics of self-realization. The same thing here with ethics of self-realization. I don't know how far we'll get with those this morning. By the way, <clears throat> some of you know, some of you don't. I'll just let you in on a little blessing. Uh, you know, we had some certain people here last week. I don't know if they're out there this morning or not. And I had, last week, we were supposed to cover education and self-realization. 
And you know, these people that were here were involved in ethics of education. And I had no idea. I had no idea at all. So it was a great blessing that the Lord kept giving us so much about ethics of education we never could get off the subject. Because, see, we're supposed to do all of this last week. So I've got a suspicion we're not going to get through with it again this morning, but we'll wait and see. <laughs> just depends on what the Holy Spirit gives us, because I could read all four sentences and we'd be through and go home, and that'd just take maybe five minutes. Then again, you can have a hundred sentences, and it can take you less than five minutes. Then again, you can have nothing and take you all day long. It all depends. The Spirit moves, the Spirit blows where he listed. Remember John 3. It all depends on what the Holy Spirit gives us. Here's, here's how we're going to define ethics of self-realization. This is defined as the total fulfillment of a person's normal capacities through thought and practice. Does it sound a little like psychology? Well, it's a major part of the field of psychiatry and psychology today. It's defined as the total fulfillment of a person's normal capacity, that is, a person's normal internal inborn capacities through thought and practice. It starts with thought, but then it ends up with practice. Ethics of self-realization. You come to know, just look at the title of the system, you come to realize who you actually are. You come to realize self and who you are by developing these internal, these inner qualities that you have. So manifested today in the frequently asked question, who am I? That's one of the chief questions of psychiatry and psychology, is to go through the psychological and the psychiatric process of asking yourself, who am I? How do you get to know yourself? How do you get to realize who you are through the steps of self-realization? You come to realize by means of these developments of the inner qualities and the inner capacities that you have who self is and what you're really like. So it is a major part of the field of psychology and psychiatry today. Let's start with, uh, we're going to look at three important individuals and then some other people probably later on underneath them. But let's go back a long time ago. <clears throat> Remember we started last week in Ethics of Education with the founding father of philosophy, Socrates. And I said that Socrates was the first of the great trio of these ancient Greek philosophers. And so second behind... Socrates, and number one under self-realization, would be Plato. Plato. I said when we got to Socrates that we're finally getting to some names that everyone's familiar with. Plato, <clears throat> he lived 427 to 347 BC. He was a disciple of Socrates. In other words, he's the second in the chain of the trio of ancient famous Greek philosophers. Now, Plato was trained in grammar, in music, and in math, whereas Socrates was trained in geometry and astronomy. So there is a difference in the training of the two men, and it does show up in their writings. Right away, uh, we're putting Plato, although you're going to see a connection with ethics of education, we're putting Plato under another system than Socrates. The three men go together simply as being the famous three founding fathers of Western civilization, of Western culture, and of the philo philosophical, ethical system that most people are geared by and most people go by today. Yet there is a difference or why put Socrates under education and Plato under self-realization. So he was a disciple of Socrates. Remember the account we gave of Socrates' death, where he was charged with uh, corrupting the youth and the neglecting of the gods, and he's put on trial, and he incensed the court by asking to be made a public beneficiary, and he was, well, I guess you could say forced to commit suicide. So Plato was one of these disciples that was with Socrates down to the very end. Socrates killed himself in 399 B.C. And so after the death of Socrates, then the, the small band of disciples, obviously youth that Socrates had around him, split up. 
And Plato left Athens for 12 years, broken-hearted, confused, and so forth over the death of his leader, which is what sometimes takes place when you've got a great leader like Socrates who dies, then his disciples were scattered. He returned to Athens in 387. So he's been gone about 12 years. He returns to Athens in 387 B.C. and founds what was known as the Academy. Anything that's known as such and such Academy today got its name from Plato's founding of the Academy, where he applied mathematics to reason for a period of around 40 years. Well, it'd take until his death. He died in 347, and he's back to Athens in 387. It's really down into his death. So until his death, from the founding of the Academy in 387 to Plato's death in 347, he applies mathematics to the study of reason. And there's really, there's really a tremendous connection between the study of mathematics and the study of reason. You've got to have a tremendous amount of reason to be able to understand some of the higher forms of mathematics. So there is definitely a direct connection between the two. How important was the academy? Well, it didn't close down whenever Plato died. You see, Socrates, his little system of disciples, they just were scattered and everything closed down. It wasn't true with Plato. We're talking about it being founded 387. He dies 347. The academy was finally closed by the Roman Emperor Justinian in 529 A.D. Wow. It lasted a little bit shy of a millennium, 1,000 years. This academy of mathematics, of logic, of reason, of ethics that was founded by Plato. You think about how long does something really last that's founded by one individual. Rarely is it 1,000 years. So in a true sense of the word, we could say that Plato was probably the greatest of these trio of Greek philosophers as far as original thinking is concerned. I guess that we could, and I guess we might as well, make a point about the greatness of all three of them, at least the two that we've covered thus far. Socrates, we could say, would be the greatest of the three simply because he's the foundation. He's the founding father of the trio. Plato is the greatest of the three. They all have their great input into history because of his original thinking. He certainly learned a lot from Socrates, but remember Socrates was trained in geometry and astronomy, whereas Plato earlier had been, in, had been uh, trained in music, in grammar, and in mathematics. So there's going to be differences, and he certainly was the greater of the three as far as original thinking. Whenever we get to Aristotle, uh, which will be probably this morning, whenever we get to Aristotle, then we'll tell you what he was the greatest for, so you can leave a blank space there or whatever. Now, like Socrates, Plato felt that the spiritual and the moral world were far above the physical one. So you see, we're way beyond naturalistic speculative ethics. That concerned just the physical world, the physical body, the physical desires, cravings, lusts, appetites, and so forth. He felt that the spiritual and moral world was far above that, which obviously is going to take human thought, reason, intellectual exercise in order to grasp and attain. He made a statement in one of his writings that he abstained from politics. A lot of these great thinkers have been involved in politics. They came out of politics, or their, their systems had their input into politics in the past. But he said that he abstained from politics because... A man of conscience, he said, could simply not be actively involved without compromising his convictions. Amen. You know what? He was right. Amen. right. A man of conscience cannot be involved in politics without compromising his position sooner or later. In other words, he said, whenever you do compromise, you become less than a man of conscience then. In other words, I guess you would go back to naturalistic ethics and you took yourself out of idealistic ethics. A man of conscience, he said, could not really be active in politics without compromising his positions. Now, Socrates didn't have any writings. We said we gleaned what we know about him from Plato and Xenophon. Plato did have some writings. His most famous writing 
is known as the Republic. Still printed down to this day, the Republic. We're talking about over 2,000 years ago. You can still go in many bookstores and pick up a copy of Plato's The Republic. It's not written in Greek. It'll be written in English so you can understand it and read it. He also has another word which is comprised of a series of dialogues known as his Apology, where he makes Socrates the speaker. In other words, he's putting... Well, he's not putting words, so he would say. He's not putting words into Socrates' mouth. This is Socrates doing the talking, and he simply copied down. Uh, most people who've studied the works of Plato believe that those are not the words of Socrates. Those are the thoughts and words of Plato that have been put back into the mouth of Socrates. In other words, there's, there's no indication that the direct sentences that we have in the Apology that Plato alleges are from Socrates as a speaker, that that's true at all. Obviously, he's got some basis in Socrates, but that probably wasn't the wording. It probably wasn't the, the statements made by Socrates verbatim and specifically himself. Now, Plato was viewed by the Alexandrian church fathers. We're talking about now the first couple of centuries A.D. as being a kind of pre-John the Baptist, John the Baptist whose teachings prepared the way for Jesus and for Christianity. I guess we should say who prepared the world for John the Baptist, who prepared the world for Jesus. Plato was a pre-John the Baptist, John the Baptist. We pointed that out in one of the messages, the first one on the Apocrypha, that a lot of the fathers felt that, that Greek philosophy was really the foundation for Christianity. It had paved the way for man's understanding and man's reception of the Christian message. Okay, let's get into a couple of his beliefs. <clears throat> We're talking about ethics of self-realization. He said that perfectness, this is what he's best known for. This is what you ought to remember. He said that perfectness, everyone's wanting to be perfect in life, wanting to make the right decisions about things, is attained through the development of the four cardinal virtues of courage, justice, temperance, and wisdom. How do you become perfect? You develop, and in the process of becoming perfect, you realize who you are, a perfected soul. You develop those inner qualities, those internal capacities that you have. Everyone is courageous on the inside. You might not act courageous, but you have the capacity to be courageous. You have the capacity to be just, to be temperate. Everyone has the capacity for wisdom. It's just that some people choose not to develop the inner qualities. So not only would you gain perfectness in your life, but you'd gain self-realization by developing the four cardinal virtues of courage, justice, temperance, and wisdom. He said that knowledge is virtue. Remember the dictum we gave of Socrates? Socrates said virtue is knowledge and vice is ignorance. It's almost the same thing. It's just switched around. He said that knowledge is virtue and that no one ever does wrong knowingly. You think about that. This is, this is the message of the social gospel movement. It's a message of the educational system today. You can see that he's kind of halfway involved in ethics of education. No one, if, if you just, if you will enlighten people to the horrors of drug addiction, then no one will, will take drugs. That's the thought of these rehabilitation programs Amen. about drugs, That's right. chemical dependency and so forth. If you will enlighten people to the evils of it, then no one will ever do wrong knowingly. The only reason people fall into drug addiction is because of their home environment. They didn't have education. What do they try to point out? They try to point out, look at the people in drug addiction. Look at the people on alcohol. We're talking about people in the slums. We're talking about black people, they say. These are the people involved in crime not educated white people. Well, they haven't read their newspaper then. Some of, the, some of the worst drug addicts are medical doctors 
right. who have cabinets in their office filled with any type of drug they want to take. Amen. Many of them are. Amen. And you're going to go and let them cut you open? <laughs> what if they're going through uh, a flashback? An LSD flashback whenever it's time to have open heart surgery on you. Yeah. Oh, you're in a lot of trouble then. Right. Yeah. You see, they've got drugs available, any type of drug they want, right there in their office. Yeah. We're talking about educated white men. Mm -hmm. They say if you will only educate society to the terrible social diseases and people will cut out the promiscuity of their life, it doesn't work that way. But this is what much that's going on out there is founded upon. If you can educate man to the evils, then as soon as he knows what's wrong, what happens? No man will do wrong knowingly. That's exactly what Plato taught, that no man will do wrong knowingly. The people who are drug addicts, the people who are criminals out there, they got involved because of their ignorance. They didn't graduate from high school. You know this is true. Check up on who's in prison. A lot of people who never graduated from high school. And so they make invalid conclusions from that <laughs> true statistic. Yeah. That where they went wrong is education. If you could only have educated them, they never would have stolen something that didn't belong to them. They never would have tried some of these wild drugs out there now if you would only have educated them. It's the same in any area of life Education has to come first. So you see that he has one foot in self-realization and one foot in education. And really, they both kind of have to go together, as you'll see as we say some more about it. They really both have to go together. The crucial thing is to get the man educated to what those inner capacities and qualities, tell him what he has, tell him the potential that he has on the inside of him, and you watch and see what will happen. Man will become a success in life. Man will become a success. That's what the so-called chemical dependency programs are all about. Amen. You enlighten the people to the fact that this is evil that they're involved in. And you so-called rehabilitate these people. And you rehabilitate them by lots of study. You show them lots of facts, lots of sheets, a lot of case studies of what's happened to others. And pretty soon they just get enlightened to the fact that's wrong. I'll never have another drink again. Does it work that way, though? Right. Chemical dependency... You know, that's just, we're back to these modern-day cover-up names. Why don't you call him what he is? He's a bum. Amen. <laughs> Why don't you call him a drunk? That's right. Why don't you call him an addict? You don't dare call people things like oh. that. You call them a chemically dependent person. Chemical, what type of chemical are you talking about? <laughs> when you call someone a chemical dependent, it sounds like chemical is their father's name or something. Right. And they're a dependent. And he gets a $1,000 income deduction on his tax form because he's got a dependent. His chemical's dependent there. You don't even know what someone's talking about when they talk about these chemical dependency programs. What you mean, this is where a lot of bums live. This is a house where addicts are. This is a house where prostitutes live. Call it the prostitute, addict, drunk, bum house. But you don't hear it. It's out, it's out there on the front, this chemical dependency program, this detox center. What you say? It's a, it's a, it's a bomb center. We got bombs living in here, but no, you got to, you got to work on the mind. You got to show them they're not so bad after all. You simply became dependent on a chemical. You didn't call him a wine though. You didn't call him a drunk, which maybe would wake him up. No, you try to use psychology, psychiatry on them to educate them out of all of their mischief and out of all the, of their sin that they're in. The same is true not only with, with alcohol, with drugs, but with crime. Mm -hmm. <coughs> You're supposed to have crime prevention weeks in school today. You're supposed to enlighten children to the fact, see if you haven't heard this phrase before, that crime doesn't pay. Yes, it does pay too. It pays very well. The mafia are the richest people in the world today. Yeah. It pays very well. But you're supposed to be taught that. You see, this is a process of education. Crime doesn't pay. What pays? Be an honest person in your life. And what will happen? Fate will make sure that you get ahead in life. If you are an honest, courageous, just, temperate, wise individual. Well, there's the four cardinal virtues of Plato. Right in a children's lunchbox, a school program development. 
And would someone say, well, we're involved in Plutonic ideas? No, let's say this is good modern American education. No, it's not. That's Greek philosophy. It's these Greek systems that we're talking about. Crime Prevention Week. You're supposed to educate them. You're supposed to tell the children what prison is all about, what prison is like. In other words, to kind of frighten them, more or less, away from doing evil and toward doing well, toward doing good in their life. Show them what it, what it means to be a hardened criminal. Criminal. I remember seeing. I remember seeing films way back early. I'm talking now about grade school, uh, and this was back whenever drugs were, you know, really coming out then. And they'd show films of, you know, the arm of an addict, and you'd see all the needle holes in it, and you know, it just frightened you out of your mind when you're in the sixth grade or something. They're trying to frighten you away from ever doing something like That's that. Right. And they show you a picture of downtown, any town, <clears throat> USA today. Back then it was New York. It had to be New York or Chicago or, you know, Cleveland, one of the big cities. And there you see the winos out sleeping on a park bench somewhere. They show you, this is what will happen if you don't mind Mrs. Smith in class and learn your ABCs. This is what will happen to you. It's kind of like a threat held over everyone that if you don't get education in your life, this is what's going to happen to you. Well, one of the problems of that is there are many people who don't have education who've never turned out to be a wine bibber, never turned out to be an addict, right. never turned out to be a prostitute. Yeah. Right. The systems have many loopholes. The systems have many, have many fallacies that are inherent in the system. We've said before that the systems of men are only as great as the man that invented them, and all men are fallible. Mm -hmm. So you've got to have something better than the system of some man. Mm -hmm. Well, here are some responses to the ethics of platonic ideas. Of course, a lot of what we've said about Socrates now could be said about Plato because he does have one foot in ethics of, of education. Remember we said that if you educate a lost man, you only make him a smart sinner, not a saved saint. Amen. You only condemn the man more to give him more education. He just has more opportunity. Now he doesn't have to go out and uh, and try to bum off the street from someone. Now he's intelligent enough to defraud banks with his computer at home. You got him so bright that he can really make some of these big time swindles, taking several million dollars out of the corporation instead of this petty burglary of breaking someone's window and stealing a lamp out of their living room. Well, there again, we're back to some of the fallacies of the system there. The more you educate, you see these uneducated people, they don't know how to work computers at home. They don't know how to punch computers out and switch that money around. You know, I remember, I don't know if I ever mentioned this before, I remember reading a long time ago about a group, I don't remember if they were out in California, it seems like they were because Silicon Valley, all the money that you have, the high-tech industry that you have out there, but there was a group of people who had their computer at home hooked up to several banks, and what they did is they shaved off a penny of everyone's deposit that they made in, in numerous banks. They could take off a penny, and the bank would never catch that penny that was gone. You know how much they made? Millions of dollars. Amen. They shaved off, like someone would make a deposit. You know, if you make a deposit, and you've got several checks, and it's $114.15. Just shave off one penny, $115.14. And for the most part, many times they'll never catch that a penny's been shaved off. And they shaved that off, you know, with this computer system, and made that penny deposit in their own account. And they made more than a million dollars doing that. Now, that took a lot of brains. That took a lot of brains. That came out several years ago. That took a lot of brains to be able to figure out how you could do that. You see, your average person wouldn't know where to begin on, how he, on knowing how to hook into a bank and take a penny off of someone else's deposit. It's a deposit. And put it in your account without having to fill out a deposit slip. How can you do things like that? Somebody did. And he made a lot more money than these hoodlums that just break in store windows. Yeah. You see what education did for that individual. And it's done a lot, it's done a lot worse. It's done a lot worse. Well, some responses to platonic ideas. Virtues cannot be gained or developed according to Christian doctrine without the power of the Holy Spirit. That's Galatians chapter 5. The fruit of the Spirit, that's just a, another name for the virtues that they're talking about. Virtues cannot be gained or developed according to Christian doctrine without the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Galatians chapter 5. Verse 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the, lust, for the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do those things that ye would. How do you like that? It says you can't do the things that you would. You don't have a yeah. choice to do right or do wrong. Right. You will only do wrong. Amen. When you're controlled by the flesh, when you're not, first of all, saved, and secondly, baptized in the Holy Spirit, then you will only do wrong. The Bible says right here in this verse, ye cannot do those things that ye would. Guess what? You can be educated to the fact that you should do this, and that's what frustrates people. Amen. Because you know what you should do, but you don't have the power to do it. For the continuation of... Guess what? You can be educated to the fact that you should do this. And that's what frustrates people. Amen. Because you know what you should do, but you don't have the power to do it. That's right. That's a sad state to be in. And, and even Christians are in that state because they're not being taught the Word of God. They know what they should do, but they don't have the power. They don't use the power to do what they know they should do so that ye cannot do those things that you would. Verse 19, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Goes on listing all those. He said, I've told you before that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. You see, it reads kind of like Plato's virtues. Gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. There's one of them, temperance. Amen. Against such there is no law. They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. We live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Plato's virtues of wisdom and courage and temperance and justice, those are good virtues. We would wish everyone had them. We'd wish all Christians had them. But you're not going to have those, and nor particularly nor are you going to be able to develop those without the power of the Holy Spirit. It's just going to be in, impossible to have and then to develop the so-called virtues that the Bible calls the fruit of the Spirit without the Holy Spirit. Another response, Plato's emphasis on wisdom, education, knowledge. He does make an emphasis there because he has a foot in ethics of education. Is void of the emphasis in the teaching of Proverbs which tells us that true wisdom is founded on the fear of the Lord. True wisdom is founded on the fear of the Lord. We could do a whole study in what the fear of the Lord is. But you have it over there in Proverbs 1 and I think over in either Proverbs 9 or 10. You got it twice. That the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and then secondly, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It's the very beginning. It's the very beginning. Another response to Platonic ideas is that nature, history, and the Bible all inform us by example that men do commit wrong acts knowingly. Plato said that knowledge is virtue and no one ever does wrong knowingly. We just went through a little history of that. And if you'll educate man, no one would do what's wrong knowingly. You know, you can even reduce it to something simple. No one would really throw trash out of their window on the highway if they would really think about the consequences, that what if everyone on the planet did that every day of the year, then pretty soon the planet would be nothing but a garbage mound. And if you could educate, you know, there, there, are, there are classes on educating against throwing things out of the window, Amen. educating you about pollution out there. There are classes on that, that if you'll educate man, then man won't do wrong. But that simply doesn't work. History, the Bible, just human nature proves that many men do do many things wrong and of all things, they do it knowingly. They do it knowingly. 
As a matter of fact, the Bible says that's what makes them so guilty, is they did wrong and they knew that they were wrong whenever they did it. Whenever you have done wrong in the past, you knew, for the most part, 90% of the time, you knew you were doing wrong. Only in 10% of the areas was it something you just weren't enlightened about. For the most part, any time you've done something wrong in the past in your life, you knew that you were doing something wrong. Even after becoming spirit-filled, a spirit-filled Christian, when you've done wrong, you knew that you were doing wrong whenever you did it. And you did it anyway. And you had education, and you had the baptism, and you had salvation, you had a lot of things. <clears throat> And you still did wrong, you did wrong knowingly. That brings to mind the last verse of Romans chapter 1. Here Paul's gone through a list of 23 different sins of the Gentiles. And look what he says here in the last verse of Romans 1. And you can find your own multitude of examples in the Bible of people who've done wrong and of people who did it knowingly. That man over there in 1 Corinthians 5 caught in the incestuous relationship, he didn't do that not knowing what he was doing. He did it wrong, and he did it knowingly. The same is true in, like I say, about 90% of the cases. People who do wrong do it, and they know that it's wrong. They just do it anyway. Look at this last verse. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, he says they not only do it, but they have the audacity to have pleasure in it while they do it. Amen. We could say audacity or we could say common sense. You might as well enjoy it if you're going to do it. And that's exactly what the Gentiles were known for. He said they not only do it, but they have pleasure in the deeds that they do. But prior to that, he said they know the judgment of God. Well, you say, how could they know that? Well, you can read verses 11 to 16 of chapter 2 and you'll find out how they can know that that they which commit such things are worthy of death. They do it anyway. You'll hear the testimony of criminals on the witness stand. They did it. The gun fired accidentally and all of this nonsense. They did wrong knowingly. You say, well, it was drugs that compelled them to do that. Well, let's go back to the drugs. They took the drugs knowing it was wrong. Well, it's because they were such and such. Well, they did that because they knew it was wrong. Somewhere you're going to have to admit to the fact that you knew you were wrong when you did something wrong. Right. And by the way, that's the only way you can ever become right in life, is admit to the fact that I'm doing this and I know that I'm wrong. Otherwise, listen, dear friends, otherwise there's no basis for making any decisions. You don't know anything. You just go through life and you can always use the excuse, I didn't know any better. I, you know, if that's true, the best thing to do would be to stay out of education. Because then you've got a good excuse. You didn't know any better than that. Stay out of education. Stay out of the Bible. And then you can, you can plead uh, not innocence, but you can plead not knowing any better whenever Judgment Day comes. And yet, is that going to really affect whether you go to heaven or go to hell? That you plead ignorance? You can't plead innocence, but you can plead ignorance. I didn't know any better. Well, the facts of experience of our, own, of our own nature tell us that that is wrong, that we do know whenever we do wrong. As I say, that's what makes us guilty in the eyes of God because we're no, we know that we're wrong when we're doing it. And more than that, that's what's a blessing that we at least, we're not like an animal, we have the light on the inside of us that we know that we're wrong. How could you ever change? if you didn't know that you're wrong. You've, you've got to listen to that voice that tells you that you're wrong. You can't try to snuff him out. You've got to listen. That's, what, that's the privilege that you have. It's something inside you telling you that you're doing wrong. This is wrong. You better not do this. Animals don't have that. Plants don't have that. Trees don't have that. Human beings do. Okay, a second individual. We'll move on beyond Plato to Aristotle. Socrates was under education. We'll put Plato and Aristotle primarily under self-realization. 384 to 322 B.C. He studied under Plato. Plato under Socrates, Aristotle under Plato. And he was the first man to develop ethics as a system of study in school, where ethics actually became like a class, like the three R's. Ethics became 
a class to study in school. You might not have known this about Aristotle, but he was a personal private tutor of Alexander the Great whenever Alexander was 13 years of age. Aristotle was his personal tutor. Do you know what Aristotle founded? Plato founded the academy. Aristotle founded what was known as the Lyceum. And most of your colleges today have a building known as the Lyceum right on campus. We had one at the University of Mississippi known as the Lyceum Building. He founded his school known as the Lyceum, L-Y-C-E-U-M, in 335, where over a process of time he came to repudiate a lot that he had learned from Plato. Now, not only did he create the study of ethics, but he also created the study and the science of logic. We credit him with both of these things as a system of study in school. Some of his works, he wrote a book. Most of these are still available. I can't say all of them because I don't have all of them, but maybe all of them are. I have a large number of them at home. He wrote a series of books. One was entitled Metaphysics. As far as I know, well, I'm positive these are still published today. Metaphysics, Physics, and Ethics. Now, we said that Socrates was the greatest of the three. By the way, Aristotle is the third and the final member of the Greek trio of philosophers. Socrates was the greatest because he founded the trio. Plato was the greatest because he was an original thinker. Aristotle was the greatest because he's influenced the world more than the other two combined. He's had a profound influence upon the church and then through the church upon the world because the church has influenced the whole world. Beginning with the writings of Thomas Aquinas in the 12th century AD. And we'll probably get to some of, the, some of the doctrines of Aristotle whenever we look at people like Aquinas and the history of the church during that time. So I'll save most of that for them. But you can be certain that a lot that goes on in the church and the world has been influenced directly by these three books, Metaphysics, Physics, and Ethics by Aristotle. The opening line, I'll give you a, a dictum of his here, the opening line of Metaphysics says, man should simply relax and enjoy contemplation of himself. Mm -hmm. Self-realization, contemplation. You ever sat down and contemplated self? Well, you got it right from Aristotle. Trying to figure out who I am. You know, the people who do that are the deeper thinkers in the world, by the way. Yeah. If you say, I've never done that, it's because you're not too bright. <laughs> it's because you just took everything as it came. Instead of sitting down and trying to figure out the world and yourself. Who, who am I? You know, whenever you're outside of Christianity, that's a brilliant question to ask. Who am I? What am I? Amen. You know, what am I? Amen. It's a brilliant question to ask. Amen. It's founded back here with these founding father of, of self-realization. He said that man should simply relax and enjoy the contemplation of himself. He said that happiness comes through doing nothing to excess but do everything in moderation. He's kind of the founding father of happiness as well. Not hedonism, but the happy-go-lucky nature of a lot of people. But that would teach that even sin would be allowed, as long as you do it in moderation. He said you can do anything as long as you don't do it to excess. Enjoy everything, but enjoy it in moderation. Okay, a third member. We're coming up to recent times. We'll cover Aristotle more some other time. Is the great German idealistic thinker Hegel, who lived 1770 through 1831. He was born at Stuttgart, educated at Tübingen University, and was the most dominant figure of German idealism, as well as German self-realization. Hegel, H-E-G-E-L. I don't know if you've heard of him, but again, we're talking about names famous on the level of Nietzsche and Machiavelli and so forth. Hegel, 
1770 to 1831. He wrote, and these are still available, The Phenomenology of the Mind, 1797, Logic, two parts, 1812 and 1816, and The Philosophy of Right, 1821. But his most interesting one is the first that I mentioned, The Phenomenology of the Mind, 1797. Now, the system of Hegel, I have to admit, is proverbially difficult. It's a form of German idealism, which was a philosophical movement in Germany at the end of the 18th century. Remember, we're talking about idealistic ethics now, so there is a connection between German idealism and speculative idealistic ethics, as well as what we're saying now, self-realization. His, his theories, they're very, very difficult to understand. They're even more difficult to explain. I'm going to try to sum some of it up. And all it is, is is a summing up of the thoughts of Hegel regarding philosophy, regarding German idealism, regarding especially self-realization. It's proverbially difficult. I mean, by that, people say, uh, you know, if something's difficult, then you might have heard it compared to the thoughts of Hegel. They'll say that's about like, the, about like the Hegelian process of the dialectic. If you've heard that, they, it's used as a proverb to show that whatever you're talking about now is just is extremely, extremely difficult to grasp, to understand, and especially to explain to others. So it goes something like this. The philosophers of the world had had a problem with trying to develop a consistent system of philosophy and of ethics because the world is always changing. You no sooner get your system built and the whole world changes. The way things are done, the way things are thought, the way things are handled in the world. And Hegel recognized this as a student of history and as a student of philosophy that you no sooner get a system built and the world changes and your system is simply not valid anymore. So Hegel was the first one to come up. It shows his brilliance here. He was the first one to come up with the idea that since change is eternal and not the static universe, then why not incorporate the doctrine of change into my philosophy as being the very heart of my system? Because if I can get change, the doctrine of change, into the heart of my system, it'll repudiate the static universe view of the ancient philosophers and it will ensure that my system will never be overthrown. Because every time the world changes, my system will change, but the change is inherently built into the system. And so it's got several points. The first point, <laughs> you see, this is what I'm talking about. It's difficult to grasp it. So I'll try to sum it up in three points of what his process was for his system of self-realization, ethics, philosophy. It covers everything. He's supposed to cover everything. First of all, you start with a principle. You start with an idea. Any idea, any thought, any principle you want to. You call that your thesis. Then you bring to that the opposite of that principle or that idea. In other words, you couldn't ask for anything worse than the opposite of what you're saying as far as a confrontation of your belief. We're not talking about a watering down. We're talking about a direct opposite, which would amount to a repudiation of the first belief. You couldn't ask for any greater. In other words, he's giving us the outer limits of the extent so that if something happened any less than that, his system will still be intact, which in essence is right. So you start, number one, with a principle, with an idea that you call your thesis. Then number two, you bring its opposite, which you call the antithesis or the antithesis, the opposite. This is still used down to today. This is how a lot of things are figured out in science, mathematics, logic today. You start with a thesis. You attack it with its antithesis. And then what do you produce? Synthesis. You produce a combination of the thesis and its opposite, which brings us the synthesis. Those are the wow. three terms. The thesis attacked by the antithesis, which produces the synthesis. And then, that's not all, that's point three, that ends the system. And then the system starts over. Then you pretend that the synthesis is nothing but a thesis to begin with. And you start the process over. 
Yeah, it, it never ends. It never ends. But you see, the world's always changing. That way you can always change your system and still stay right. <laughs> you see, you see, there, I can't give you a list of things that he believed, like he believed in education. Or something. He didn't believe anything. He believed in a thesis. You can take any thesis you want to and attack it with its antithesis, and it will synthesize itself, and it will produce the synthesis. Then you, then you go to, to section B, and now you take the synthesis and make it a thesis, and you attack it with an antithesis, which becomes a synthesis. Then you go to C section. You take that synthesis. Every time something changes in the world, you take that synthesis, turn it into another thesis, attack it with another antithesis, it becomes another synthesis. You take the synthesis, turn it into a thesis, and pretty soon you've got the antithesis all over again. So he said, this is, this is going to set us free from the problems of the static universe philosophical views in the past. Because he said the world's not static. The world is changing all the time. Men are changing. Situations are changing all the time. Remember, with all these other men, we've given you some little statement about what they believe. The four cardinal virtues of Plato. He doesn't believe in anything except everything. Everything is possible. If you take a thesis, you bring the antithesis, and you'll produce the synthesis as a result of that. Now, he didn't believe, however, that it was going to go on forever. He believed that through a process of time, and, and you see he almost, and well, he did. You end up back with a static universe view. If you ever believe that's going to come to an end, then you believe that change is going to come to an end. He believed that this is going to go on. He didn't know exactly how long. It was going to go on a while. In his early life, he later repudiated this, but in his early life, he was a little naive, and he thought that the, that the thesis, the antithesis, the, synthes the synthesis had been worked through process for a long enough period of time that it had produced, you know, it's kind of like Nietzsche's Superman. What this was going to do was produce a superman, a, a super government, a super world in the final analysis is what it's going to do. It's going to produce a synthesis where we've had all of the opposites of the world joined together, kind of melted together, and we produce this final synthesis, which is what the world and humanity is all about. So it's kind of like the striving, not so much of the will to power, but of the final production of some superhuman figure or superhuman planet or whatever. So in his early life, he was a little naive, and he felt that this process had reached its climax in Napoleon Bonaparte. Oh. Napoleon died, though. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to change then. As soon as the world changes, you got to change. You see, he made a mistake against his own system by ever trying to bring a finality to it because you're going to end up with a static universe again. So that was in his early life. He finally did give that up. and. Later on in his life, he adopted and never gave up that the synthesis of it all was the Prussian state, was the state of Prussia, ancient Germany. He never gave that up. Guess what? Prussia doesn't exist anymore today. Things are always changing. Things are always changing. So that's known as the Hegelian process of the dialectic. Now, we've told you before in passing comments, we've never studied dialectical theology, but we've pointed out in passing comments that a lot of the theology being taught in seminaries today is known as dialectical theology. Do you remember what I said about that? Uh -huh. I said that dialectical theology tells you yes and no to every question that you ask. Remember, I said it gives you the yes yeah. and no answer. Well, you see what I'm saying? Those are two opposites of one another. That's the, that's the thesis, that's the antithesis, uh -huh. is yes and no. And dialectical theology is taught in many of the seminaries today. And it came from Hegel. This was, this was, you can see that he's trying to work his way. This was really preparation for Darwin's theory of evolution. Darwin's theory is that we have a combination of everything. We produce this synthesized form. And then what does that do? That mingles with something else. In another synthesized form, we're always trying to reach a final product. But we never do because evolution keeps on and on going along. This is one of the things that paved the way for for Darwin's theories of evolution was the Hegelian process of the dialectic. Well, you think about that. Oh, Don't spend too much time, though. <laughs> but you think about that, and you'll probably see what I'm talking about, that it, it, it's had an effect. Now, if you haven't, we're really talking now about 
about higher education. You don't just meet that. Generally, you don't meet that out there on the job, but you do meet that in things that you read. You do meet that in the schools. That's the way a lot of things are figured out, is you bring the thesis, you bring the antithesis, and what that is supposed to do is synthesize and give you the result. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's just because you haven't been reading certain things that I've read in the past. I just know the way that things are governed. I mean, even sometimes, sometimes, let's say, even in governmental, even in political circles, decisions are made on that basis. Let's take the best of what could happen if we make this decision. You think about this. Let's take the worst of what could happen if we make this decision. And what do you do? You synthesize those two, and you take a compromise somewhere in between. Isn't that right? Amen. You know that's true. You know that's the way people think. We'll take the, what's the best that could happen to me? What's the worst? What could really go wrong here? Yeah. You try to take those two and synthesize them and make your decision of what's right based on Hegelian dialectic philosophy. Um, you didn't know that's what you were doing. No <laughs> you try to think what's the worst that could happen to us in this situation? What's the best that could happen to me in this situation? <laughs> And you synthesize it. Is that, is that really a valid way to make a decision about right and wrong? No, that's not valid. That is not valid. Because what if the best of what could happen in the situation is the will of God for you? Then why take something less halfway in between the best and the worst? <laughs> You're taking something halfway in between. You know, we have made, we have made in comments in passing before that the worst that could happen to you if you trusted God for divine healing is that you'd die. But that's not dialectical theology because we'd strike a compromise between the best and the worst. We don't strike a compromise. We go for the best. Divine Amen. healing all the time. Amen. Amen. So you see that? Don't think of that in your mind now that, well, that was Hegelian dialectical theology. No, it wasn't either. If we would have stricken a compromise in between, then yes, that's exactly what that would be. Now, you watch the decisions you make, and you see if you make it on the basis of you're going to rate this from 1 to 10. I'm going to put it on a scale 1 to 10. And what will you take? You'll try to take either 4, 5, or 6, somewhere in between. Why not take what the will of God is? You've got to know what the will of God is, and you've got to stand by that. You can't go through these mental gymnastics. You see, uh, I'm telling you, just you'd be amazed at how you're influenced. By, by people you've never heard of. You've never heard of Hegel, someone out there. So I've never heard of Hegel before. But you'd be amazed how you're influenced because the world's been influenced by him. And guess what? You're influenced by the world. Look over in Romans 12. Look what Romans 12 says. Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world. You see, this study in ethics, the whole study is going to be a process of transforming your mind, of conforming you unto Christ and to his word and not to this world, because we have all been conformed to the world. You can't help. We were brought up in this world. None of us were raised on the planet Mars. We were raised on this planet. You can't help, but you've been affected by this world. And guess who's in control of this world? See, all these processes are forgetting. These men and their systems, they forget. We're talking about a world controlled by the powers of darkness. We're talking about men controlled by fallen natures, not by the spirit of Jesus Christ in them. And we said that back in the very beginning of ethics. That's wow. two strikes against speculative ethics. Uh, is they forget their per that we've got a personal enemy whose name is Satan. Amen. They forget that we're a fallen creature. Amen. We're fallen. Romans 3, uh, Psalm 14. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. We're totally corrupt before the new birth experience. Paul knows what he's talking about. And we do too. Be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Not that ye may prove what is that Hegelian dialectic in-between answer. Not that you can prove what the synthesis is in the situation. Look here that you can prove what the will of God is in the matter. 
and not weighing. In other words, it's kind of like you put it on a balance scales and you weigh the alternatives and see what's the worst that could happen and what's the best that could happen from the situation. Let me give you another example about this that I'm just thinking of now concerning the spending of money. How many times do you weigh the alternatives? What would happen if I spent this? And what would happen if I didn't spend that? And then you use that criteria as a basis for the decision that you make. I'm not saying that you just foolishly just spend money all the time because there are things you have to take into consideration. If you owe a bill, if you owe money next week, you better have some money for that bill whenever it arrives. But it's a different thing entirely in seeking the Lord. Now, is this your will? In contrast to weighing the alternatives. Now, if I spend this, then, then what's going to happen in the future? Or if I don't spend that? And then you try to make your decision whether to buy, and you go to the store. And you make your decision on whether to purchase something by dialectical process. You give a thesis, an antithesis, and then you give yourself the synthesis. You synthesize the situation. Okay, we hardly got into self-realization. We'll stop there, and I guess we'll start again next week. That will cover the men we wanted to cover. <clears throat> we'll get into some more personal things. That will apply a lot more specifically to everyone when we talk about self-realization again next week.